they could go in and just uh, horse play and wrestle and all that stuff. And, and there's room for some of that in the spring. But I think it's a good time to stimulate them, maybe through clinics, maybe through uh, uh, intramural programs where they would might run an intramural program. I think that's really good for your varsity athletes. And while we're on it, if you ever get in high school, I really, I really felt that uh, it was uh, really, uh, I felt it was really uh, uh, important uh, in high school that we went out and like the junior highs couldn't afford a wrestling program. Okay, so let's say there's six or three feeder junior highs into our high school. And what we did is we had to first of all make sure that all legal legal aspects were taken care of, like when a kid uh, would go in, would participate, he would sign a, a, a legal form. But uh, the coach would take the top kids down and break them down, say maybe he had three guys that looked were excellent coaches, and he would take those three guys and they would be the head coach at the junior high. And then he would put two assistant coaches under each of those guys, and then they would go out to the junior high for a two-week training session. And they would train the kids for two full weeks, or maybe three weeks, and then at the end of the training session, they would have a team tournament. And it was really neat. It was neat because the high school guys had to, had to learn to work with junior high kids. They had to face some of the discipline problems. And I felt it was a really growing experience for the high school guys, and yet it really exposed the junior highs to, to good skill training instead of just a, a PE guy having to go through a, a six-week wrestling lesson plan. Right? Here you had these highly motivated uh, wrestlers, uh, really intent on teaching, and then you had the competitive aspect where the junior highs were going to compete with each other, and I thought that was really valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a varsity and JV for each of the junior highs. Yeah? Oh, and the junior highs they, Right, competed with each other. They had dual meet tournaments, uh, they had dual meet uh, schedules, and then they had an individual outstanding uh, for all all of them came together to high school and competed. Now there's some problems with that in that administrative problems that the junior highs probably don't have math, so you had to ship out math to the junior highs from the high school. But uh, some of them did, and, and it worked out really well. And I thought that was really neat. But it, again, the, the, coach, the head coach at the rest at the high school had to do some extra work. And the end, though, I think it would pay off. After the season was over in the spring, which is when they run this season. Now we've we've done that here. You know, I I picked up that concept from high school, and then I I did it here with my wrestlers, taking six or three of my top wrestlers and having them go out and recruit guys for the meal program. We worked that one year, and it worked really good. And I think that's the only time that the wrestling intramural program has really went well. And we were even thinking about you guys having to do that in an intramural type thing, where you'd have to go out and recruit against each other and uh, you'd have to be able to motivate the kids to come out and work out for a couple weeks, and then you would have to administrate a tournament as uh, analysis of wrestling class. Uh, I kept it in the back of my mind. Cliff said he kind of wanted to go ahead with it this year, so you know that's one reason we didn't pursue it really heavily. But I think um, I can talk a storm up in here and tell you what's going to happen to you and what you're experiencing as a coach. There's nothing if you're out there on the battle line you're doing it right now. I think that could be the most practical experience that I could require of you uh, here in uh, this class. Anyway, uh, I'm working on motivation really hard for next year right now. Right now is the time for motivation. It's the time to draw the team together. It's the time to, to really, I think, do fun activities that draw the team together. You know, I think there's some guys that would stay on the team uh, because they just want to participate in that spring retreat at the end of the year. That's the highlight of the year. I mean, yeah, and they get to go to Colorado River and kill themselves. Uh, but they love it, you know. And I think there's guys that would stick with the program just for that aspect. And I think that's, that helps your program go. And, uh, and it costs me money. It, it costs money to pay the guys gas mileage on those trips. It costs money to give them a meal. Another thing is we treat every one of our wrestlers at the end of the year to a free banquet. They have to pay for their days, but a free banquet. What we also do in that is we honor guests or honor people that really served our program, like the trainer, or the equipment man, or somebody that's really served our team really well this year. We give them a free ticket to that banquet. And, you know, you say, well, hey, budget-wise, I can't afford that. 
But let me tell you, it's worth every penny you raise. Because you probably have to raise it. You won't get it budgeted, that's for sure. But I, 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 have, a, I have this philosophy, or this feeling, you give up a little to get a lot. And I believe that totally. And I, I felt that in, in everything that I've given to the kids, they've given back twice as much. And, that, and that's really, I think that's important. And those things you've got to stimulate yourself. And that's what makes a program grow. Okay. <clears throat> Structuring leadership for next year is another thing you do. You just don't like, the guys just don't vote and get a leader and then, well, wow, you're, you're set. I think you've got to develop a leader. Hopefully your program has that built into it that you're developing that within all the guys are, are developing maturity and leadership. But I think too that you've got to stimulate talent on your team. You've got to take certain guys and you've got to take their abilities and, and you've got to stimulate what you have to offer. And I, I think that's really important. So right now, like for next year, I'm thinking, okay, who's the guy? You know, and, and I'm not only doing it for our team, I'm doing it for all areas. Like the gospel team, like Bob and I have sat and we've prayed a couple times that God would give us wisdom on the guy that's to take over the, le- the, the gospel team leadership. And, and it's, uh, now that I've mentioned the gospel team, I just might comment that, uh, you know, here is an extra, an extra uh, for me as a coach, an extra voluntary assignment for the guys. But this extra has been maybe one of the key unifying factors in the whole team. From the guy that doesn't get to wrestle a lot to the guy that wrestles a lot. It's unified them together because it gave everybody on the team a meaningful experience. It's not, well, uh, I can have a meaningful experience because I'm talented and I'm number one jock. It's like we're all number one jocks when we participate in that gospel team. And it's a common bond and it's a common Looks like we're all varsity members when we go on that team. And, and there's something about that. I, I'm not sure I could clearly uh, share with you what it is, but it has given to our team, uh, 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 it's given a lot to our team. And uh, as you say, well, what, Coach, what are the key factors that you feel that have really contributed to the success of your team, uh, to the unity of your team, to the spiritual growth of the guy? Okay, here's one of these underlying things that I feel that you can't put a, a, a percentage on as to how it's contributed. But it's been a great contribution to our team. Guys that I think would not be with us right now if it, hadn't, if it wasn't for a gospel team. And because we kept them with us, some of them just tremendous growth physically so that they started having a meaningful experience as a starter on the team by the time they were juniors where we had lost those guys. Because they seen no hope physically as a freshman. But they enjoyed the successful experience of contributing to the gospel team. Another area that we might put down as a measure to the success of the team has been the prayer, prayer girls. And I've seen that, I, some of the teams are expanding that, and I think that's really neat. You know, the power of prayer, you know, I just believe in it because I've seen how it's worked in my life and how God's provided for me, and yet, boy, I just really feel that those girls have done a tremendous job. Not all of them, but some of them have. And I think through it, God has rewarded their prayers. And so some of our success probably is not because of us, but because somebody prayed for us. I think if there's one person that, I just told the guys yesterday, I've really thought who really contributed to our team, and I didn't tell the whole team. I think there's one person that really contributed a lot. That's my mom. I think my mom prayed Jimmy Blake to the national championship. And I believe that. I know my mom. She, she prayed on her knees every day for at least a half an hour. I know just for, for her boys. And a part of that was my team. And I know my mom played a, a great part of that. As, as like, G- Jimmy was able to give up areas of his life that he held back that kept him from being, a, from reaching his potential. You know, doubts of, of not being good enough, not learning the technique enough. Just to the point of, I forget all those doubts. I'm just going to go out and wrestle the best I can. And then all of a sudden, man, his potential started coming out. And then his confidence started building. And as, as, he, as he's he willing to lose, he started winning. Uh, and it was tremendous to see that. I was telling the guys yesterday, it was neat to, to see the ultimate achievement of a coach and an athlete, the national championship. The ultimate achievement, you know, for somebody in business, maybe to become president of the organization. But what was really needed was to see the maturing process that caused that physical results to happen, spiritually and physically. Uh, Jimmy, really good and start to handle some areas of his life and grow in his life. 
And to me, that was the championship. That was the music experience right there. The change that happened in Jimmy. National Championship, I'll cherish and always be proud of it. But I can't measure the worth of, of the change in Jim's life because of the process that he went through to become a champion. And I think it came when he gave his complete, completely over to God and, and let him control that area of his life. Okay, moving on, we talked about leadership and then uh, we went on into more of an individual. This is the time that you're looking at individuals and working more individualistic or during the season you're thinking of a team concept more. And I'm thinking in the area of, of physical preparation, you know, like putting in your team offense. You know, you're thinking team-wise at that time. You still have individual, you're looking at everybody as an individual, but you're more team-orientated in, in the preseason. Well, now in the fall, you're thinking more individual. Uh, you might have seen some guys going through some struggles and you just didn't want to pursue it at that time with all the pressures. And now's the time to pursue it uh, through interviews, through just bringing to the surface things that are challenging you, you know, and trying to get them to, to react. Uh, <clears throat> I also mentioned that if, if you're in a state program where there's a lot of pressure and you're keeping a job with being a successful coach as far as winning and losing, you might have to spend a little bit more time in recruiting than I do here. Okay, I, I, I mentioned that I like to think internally, okay? And, and because I think internally, I, I, my time commitment is mostly right here on campus. I don't pursue a lot of time commitment to outside recruiting. But if I was at a state school, and, uh, I, might, I might probably be feeling differently. And I would not e ever uh, uh, talk about somebody that does that as their priorities are mixed up as a Christian coach and stuff like that. Each program's different and each individual situation's different. A lot of the things I'm sharing with you now would, would be really pertinent for Bible College if you, if, hopefully, I'm trying to bring in situations that you'll experience in high school, maybe in college, so this will be profitable for you in a state school system. But, uh, uh, then recruiting, I am recruiting, and I use most of my recruiting through recruiting packets. Later on, if a kid responds from, from the recruiting packet, has certain responses that he has to make. If he responds, I usually uh, then respond to his response. Another letter, a personal telephone call, start interviews. If he's pursuing scholarship and he has a lot of ability, we start more interaction, some more communication. If he doesn't respond and uh, the contact was pretty strong, maybe it was an old teammate of mine and I really confident in his opinions of Christian athletes and uh, this athlete is also a good, has a lot of ability, I might even follow up with a phone call even though the athlete doesn't respond. Uh, maybe that's a little bit of natural response there. Maybe I should follow up everybody, even the guys that aren't good <laughs> as far as uh, ability. And the last thing we covered last time was team activities that help unify a team help develop a team. Uh, I was saying in the past, like most people think that you start in the fall to unify your team. I think you do it in the spring. I think that's when you can do a lot of this stuff right now. And we talked about retreats, uh, Olympics, freestyle wrestling. Uh, we're having prayer partner revealing time. We're having out a super neat banquet. We have uh, the retreat to Colorado. Uh, I think it's going to be Colorado this year. I'm not sure. I don't. I don't mind. I would. I would like uh, Tahoe too. So that's a pretty good choice. Okay. Then uh, still in post season, uh, we're getting down now to uh, item 11 in post season, and this is called. Uh, uh, I would uh, label this equipment evaluation. This is the time of the year that you've got to look and see how much equipment was worn out or lost or destroyed, <coughs> and you want to. You want to just do a, an equipment evaluation at this time of the year. Go in and see what you got left, and then kind of get in your mind. You start getting ready to order your equipment for next year. This is an important administrative thing that you do at this time of the year. In the area of equipment, uh, uh, probably this should come under preseason, but we'll skip over it fast since I'll cover it now. Um, at the first of the year, we have a session where we just talk about equipment, and I will get quote I quote the guys' prices and. Each guy is outfitted with game uniform and his practice equipment. It'll come up to around $300 in equipment that each individual in the program has. 
if you really go through the cost of the shoes, the headgear, the jock, the socks, the one piece, and then in practice we have two practice optional shirts, you have the practice tights and, and all equipment that you add up that they would be using throughout the year. It's around $300 an individual, okay, of 10 guys. If just 10 guys out of 25 lose equipment, uh, you know, that's uh, $3,000 right there. 10 times 300, $3,000, okay? So you can see the cost of carelessness. Let's just say two or three guys lose their equipment. That that carelessness, and then usually you have you'll have a normal wearing out. I think we wear out about 10, 10 pieces of equipment in every area every year, and we replace that much every year. That's that's about the cost that it you know that it costs. And uh, I don't think uh, I personally the guys are not ne negligent. Okay, they're just very careless. Okay, very careless. First of all, their parents have always wrote the checkbook out. Uh, uh, you know, let me get personal. Uh, with my brother, uh, Steve, you know, he wanted to buy every shoes. He goes down to, to uh, what's the name of the store at home? Uh, I forgot the name of the person. We only got one there in Pueblo. Sporting Goods store. There's probably more now. And he, he'd just sign the thing and pick him up a, a $40 pair of baseball shoes. And my mom's paying it the next time the bills come around. And, and I don't, this is not an uncommon procedure nowadays for kids at home. You know, moms foot, foot the bill. Uh, and the, now Steve, for Steve's defense, Steve has always contributed these work and stuff at home. But, I mean, that's the atmosphere where, you know, I didn't have that kind of privilege when I come through home. I, I, you know, I had to pay for everything that I got. So when I come to school, I was more sensitive to my equipment. I wasn't so apt to run through the middle of the creek with my $50 pair of running shoes. Uh, you know, I, I was not so apt to leave my uh, uh, pants at the bottom of the locker and let them rot there for three months. And, and I found, the minute I come in the first year, I found out that, hey, we were going to have to either uh, quit supplying equipment or start taking care of it better. And so uh, I try to really make them aware of how much it's costing them when they are careless. And then, just a little helper, we, we have kind of a little... Uh, philosophy that uh, you, you, you're proud to wear the Biola B and I don't want to see it laying on the floor and stomped on and disgraced and so we try to build some team pride in the equipment area uh, not only team pride to be on a Biola team uh, I think you need to develop that and I'm talking about a team spirit pride not a not a pride that hey I'm, I'm a wrestler I'm better than you as a basketball player I think that thing uh, we need to eliminate that but I'm talking about just pride in, in yourself and uh, so we we have a fine. Uh, Coke's used to be 25 cents. They went up, so I've, I'm increasing the fine to 50 cents next year. But uh, it's a quarter. Every time I pick up a piece of equipment, uh, it's a quarter from my pocket. And uh, that has helped. That has worked pretty good. Uh, the guys, first of all, taught the guys to kind of watch out for each other and and to look after it. And another thing, it's, it's taught, taught them to be a little bit more careful. Question, Steve? to be consistent as a coach I think too that while you mentioned this and being consistent and finding everybody the superstars versus the the lowest guy on the team be consistent now where I think too it takes a little extra effort for you as a coach that means that at the end of practice uh, I'm the last one to go through the room and check out the room uh, over in the practice room and then I usually go through the dressing room and I try to do this really it only takes about a month at the first of the year that I really have to do it every day then later in the year I'm always over at the equipment room either getting some stuff in my P class. It's a matter of stopping in, seeing what's laying on the floor, what's hanging up, even stuff hanging up. It's unsupervised. I pick it up and then I just hand it in the equipment and I say, this equipment is not to be checked out until a quarter's paid, paid for. And it's worked good for us. Now, in high school, how this system would work, you know, maybe they would tell you to go blow and hey, hang wrestling, you know. And uh, I, I just, that's another thing we want to do. I want to get your... But as soon as everybody budgets, I want to bring it and cover it one day. But Steve uh, Hoffbach made a comment that it's a really neat comment, you know, how he was going to uh, limit his team to 20. 
and I thought that was kind of neat. He was going to cut thirteen to twenty, and, and that's kind of neat because uh, that's a problem he's not going to have to worry about. His problem is going to get twenty guys out, <laughs> let alone cutting guys. So I'm going to give him. A, I'm going to harass him a little bit about that comment when we cover our budget. Uh, mostly in high school, you don't have the privilege of being able the budget to supply their equipment, so the kids supply their own practice gear. What you'll have to do more in high school than we have to do here is you'll have to get the guys to really supervise the cleanliness of their equipment and stuff like that. Yeah. Pretty much so. Probably, probably so you'll have to work with that. You'll have to really work in the area of sanitary. Because wrestling, is, you can really lose a team through uh, infection and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I think it might have an effect on team morale. Uh, it could have an effect on team morale and help you build some spirit. But I think you can go overboard too because, you know, it doesn't matter whether you eat it uh, at... Uh, the sizzler and eat a steak or eat at McDonald's and have a hamburger. Basically, with the kids are, are, it doesn't, I don't think it means that much to kids anymore. But back in my days, I think we ate a sizzler, we appreciated <coughs> it more. But like seeing a uh, king size bed versus uh, a single bed and two to a bed, uh, you know, I think we've overemphasized that. I think we spoiled kids. And I, I think it's important. What I try to do is usually we basically go as go with our budget. We don't have the kind of budget for king size bed, but once in a while I try to treat the kids. You know, at nationals we try to go first class. And it, unfortunately it doesn't work out all the time. Or at least sometimes you, you, you just give them a treat. But to make it a, an everyday thing, I think they don't appreciate it. I think it's not good for them. And I learned that lesson probably my second or third year. You know, I, I was really sacrificing, doing extra things and, and laying out $50 rooms instead of $20 rooms, and I found that the guys didn't appreciate it. In fact, they become to the fact, to point that they were very unappreciative, and so I just dropped back off of it, and I found out that there were some other things that we needed to teach them. <laughs> okay, boy, we haven't even gotten into preseason yet. Okay, equipment evaluation. We're just reviewing Jimmy from last time. <laughs> so, okay, another thing that I do at this time of the year, yeah is uh is facility uh development uh evaluation of uh, i can call it facility development and and program development uh right now i like i'll go in my room and i'll just sit down in the restroom room and i'll dream you know i'll dream of the perfect room you know the videotape right there and it's all built in and you and you've got somebody pushing buttons and it's picking up a guy and then flat and they flash it up on the tv Dream. That's the time to dream, and and, I, and I've dreamed up some stuff that I could afford. That's that was really neat, you know. How to make things flow smoother in practice. How to build uh, support for the wrestling program. That's bulletin boards, uh, pictures. Uh, the hall. One year I come up with the Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame for wrestling. I think that's a that's neat. That's really neat. And uh, this that's when I did it. You know, one spring I come in there and just thought about it and. Uh, uh, man, I thought about knocking out that room, and it's a good thing I did at that time, or we'd never ever got that room, because at the time there wasn't a demand upon facility use, and there's a root classroom just sitting there empty. Never would I be able to get it now, because 100 people want to use that room. They need that room. In fact, they've already taken some of it back from me. So this is a time that you would think of your facility development, whether you have to maybe fundraise for mats or, you know, uh, getting some guys that have talent of doing artist things to maybe paint some pictures on the wall. This is the time of the year, the fall, the, the uh, postseason program. Program development. This is a time that you want to think about activities and things that would help the program go. You know, all the things that we've talked about, like the, uh, the Thursday night things with the guys at my house, and the two emphasis, and the pre- and postseason emphasis, the retreats, the uh, preseason retreat, and then later we added the postseason retreat. Every one of these, they come up through brainstorming and through accident, but they came up one at a year, okay, traditions. They've, they've just popped up, and, I, and I'm big on team traditions. I think that's really important. I really try to emphasize, and I try to build it. We, we, freshmen are nothing. They are nothing. They're just a freshman. 
you got to be a freshman for a year, uh, and you, freshmen are not given. Uh, no, you can't do that to the coach. No, I mean, <laughs> you know, another thing that seems to be growing, uh, I haven't mentioned you guys, you know, you guys take it for granted, you know, like our Christmas thing, we have uh, our, uh, what do you call those things, we, the, the one, the uh, White Elephant Awards. Hey, that turned out just, hey, well, hey, let's try it. And it, it turned out good. And now the, the White Elephant, they get awards to fit personalities, and it's so funny. You know, like uh, Jimmy, uh, some girl got the key to Jimmy's heart this year. Uh, you know, and it, it's really neat. And that's the time that we integrate the, the girls with the guys. At the Christmas party, at the beach party at the first of the year, we added that on this year. We've never had the girls meet together with the guys before the season started. So we invited them. At the end of our retreat, on Saturday night, we had a beach thing. And all the girls were invited down. We introduced all the new girls, and the girls got to see all the wrestlers, and then the next day they got to choose out of the hat the guy they were going to pray for, and they knew him. But the, it just added a lot to the girls so that they would pray more meaningfully. Um, and these things are the things that you've got to nurture, and that's why I say you sit down and brainstorm at the, at the end of the year, and you dream. I dream. I dream things that will never happen. But some of the things do happen. They really do, and, and we come up with some, some really neat activities. Prayer Girls, is, uh, it started out of the need to have help for the Brown Invitational. So I, I got some girls that were like uh, boyfriends or girlfriends of the team, uh, interested in wrestling, and kind of got about 10 of them together. I think Mark Galvio was the year he helped me. And we met about four or five times, and they were start training them to, to help us win the Brown Invitational. Well, in those times we got together, they said, well, what's some other things we can do for the team? And I said, well, why don't you pray for a guy? And we started praying, well, why don't we just draw a name and individually pray for a team? We did it that year, and it, it was kind of neat. So the next year, we formalized it. And that same group kind of grew, and they got recruits in, and then from there it grew into, so every year we have a group of girls that are, we call prayer partners. Yeah, basketball buddies. I think this year, baseball buddies are doing it. Well, it depends on the, the, the leader. Each, each year is a different personality. The, the leader has more ability to get the guys together, maybe more time. So it's been, their involvement has been great to just minimal, maybe just spring. I think the key aspect, as far as I'm concerned, is the prayer ministry. We'd love to have the girls helping maybe make uh, uh, banners for the team, and a lot of stuff like that. But the prayer thing is the key thing that we try to emphasize. And I try to, that's another area of leadership. Right now, you know, we'll, we've got to start thinking towards that girl next year that's going to take that program over where it's going to be the same girl. We've got to find somebody that will be a ministry to her. And so that's, that's that, that would go under leadership. Not only leaders on the team, but leaders on that, on that group. Okay, and, and uh, last but not least, and, and uh, for our school, it turned out to be a pretty important aspect of our athletic program, and that's the fundraising the fundraising aspects of your program. And uh, at Nationals, uh, I was supposed to sign up for a fundraising thing, and I forgot to, and I, if I ever get that, I'll try to share some of those ideas with you, because you'll, if you guys go into coaching, I'm sure you're going to have to be concerned about those areas. Just before I go on for fundraising, I'd like to share with you a little philosophy. Um, guys, I think there's... I've seen some things that bother me a little bit about the fundraising aspects of our athletic program. Uh, uh, the, I feel the, the fundraising should be projected as a support to the athletic program and not, should not be emphasized as a ministry, as, as kind of like a donation to a ministry. All right, you could consider it a ministry, but I think basically it should be given as a support to the athletic program. Uh, I just really think that they, uh, to, to really justify a ministry to Hawaii as a, a missionary outreach type thing, boy, it, it is for certain individuals and it could be. And even to Mexico and to wherever it is, but I just... I think it should be you're supporting an athlete and you're supporting that athlete is going to grow through that experience and he's going to mature spiritually and maybe he's going to become a missionary. 
because of that experience. But to say support our program because this is a, a ministry, uh, I just have, this is personal feelings and I don't condemn the other emphasis and, the, and, and I'm not sure the money spent completely for a missionary outreach, all right? And, and so, uh, like, a little bit of my philosophy, most of our fundraising comes from giving people something. They buy a ticket to an, an event. So really it's not a, uh, it's not, um, the bulk of my fundraising program is not donational, okay? And especially not for, for ministries, although I think the wrestling has as much ministry as any other team on campus, all right? I really believe that. And then I too, I believe that whenever people do donate, I try to, I, and I think I do this because I see the personal benefit we get out of it. Okay, I try to make the guys give at least one third of it back to the school. Invest it back in the school. Or in some type of giving ministry. Whether we give to West Neal, who's come up and give the team, the, the wrestling team some seminars, we have, we have donated some money back to him. We have always, we've given people gifts that really supported us. Okay, that's come out of our fundraising area. We have donated over $10,000, that might, $8,000 in monies back into actual physical stuff that will be used until they wear out by other people in the school. Okay? Whether it be the wrestling mat, whether it be uh, weightlifting equipment, whether it be speaker systems that other other uh, one of the other sports is going to use our speaker system. We bought that out of our fundraising. Okay, I, I really think it's important that you do that. So that you, you know, we talked about giving the guys first class and how they don't appreciate that. So I feel it teaches the guys a responsibility to the people that donate to them. A giving spirit and. and uh, so uh, that's all I'm going to say about fundraising. If there's some more interaction here, because I think it's a pretty strong statement that I just said here, because some people I think would really feel strongly opposite of that. My job is is developing. Christian athletes. That is my job. My job is not to go to uh, a foreign country and evangelize the people there through the athletic team. Now I believe totally that if we go and do that, that it could be a learning experience for my guys. And that's what I'm supposed to be doing, teaching them to have a burden for missions. Okay? And I could use that trip as a tool to develop within my guys. But I'm still internal. You see, I still believe that my program is for these guys right now. And that's the emphasis. And so I can justify, I can stand up and say, I don't have to say, hey, will you give so we can go uh, evangelize these people? I say, will you give so you can help develop this Christian athlete? And I'm going to help develop him by an experience of evangelism down in Mexico. Maybe, you know, maybe they're doing the same thing I'm saying. I'm just saying it may be a little different. But I'm not sure as we make the approaches through mail and stuff that that, that they realize that's the purpose. Because it is an ath it's for athletics. It's not for missionary work. I think that, um, it is. First thing you would do in, in, in the preseason program is to make sure that your new athletes got into school and got accustomed and, and got, uh, had a, a, uh, a uh, comfortable transition. And what I'm talking about here is not babying athletes, but giving them direction. You're not doing it for them, you're, you're giving them direction. And I, I really think it's a disservice to the athlete to uh, go through the line for him and do all this stuff for him. Uh, they need to, to realize that they have to take a responsibility. And I, I think this thing hurts them as athletes too. If they are giving too much and, do, and everything is done for them, then they're going to expect it to be done in sport. And in sport, you've got to learn that you have got to pay the price. You, have got, you ultimately are the one responsible for your success or failure, not the coach. And if you come in with a feeling like the coach is supposed to do this to me, and, and everything is given to you, and, and, and you're just, uh, man, I just really think 
that, that it that it uh, propagates the attitude of uh, well, it's your fault unless I get it. You know, and I I really ultimately believe that the the, the person that ultimately the person that's going to be responsible for your success or failure is yourself. And so we start out that way at the first of the year that I will give them good direction. I will suggest what classes they are going to. Uh, they go up and they do it all. Now, if they encounter problems, I, I'll have them come back to me, but ultimately I try not to do anything that a, another student would not have the same right to do. I really try to do that. I try not to violate that principle. I think that's important. And sometimes it hurts us. It means maybe it's not the best schedule possible for the individual's concern. A little struggle. Yeah, but I think it's important. All right, so at the first year we're doing that. We meet them. And this is an important time that your old timers know the program. They know the feeling, the philosophy, the atmosphere. This is the time to get the new individuals alone and really hit them heavy at that time. I really indoctrinate them. And I believe in indoctrination. I think that's important. You've got to tell them what it's going to be like, what it's going to be about, and this is the guideline. I, you know, I am strong there. And, and, and uh, you've got to do it with a feeling of love so they don't feel like this is the general and what he says is what, and I am not, I'm just a, a piece of mechanical piece in the, in the system, okay? You cannot ever allow them to feel that. But yet you have got to be a leader. You have got to be a leader. And your success or your program is going to determine whether you're going to be a leader and whether you keep control of the situation. And I tell you, there's nothing like the first day. You've got to start then. And I, I'm always of the feeling that you start with the tight fist, and as they show responsibility and handle responsibility, then you open it up. And my, I really feel that the freshmen <coughs> don't have too much opportunity to express themselves. I, I think they do, but they don't have too much opportunity to change the system. Let me put it that way. They pretty much are under the guidelines of who's over them for the first year. They are freshmen, and I mean that. And, uh, but as a, an individual commits to you, me as a coach, as he commits to the philosophy of the program, as he shows maturity, then he's given more freedom, more freedom to express his own desires, more freedom to make decisions, more freedom to buck the system. And, and I think, uh, you know, maybe Jimmy and Paul, I hope that's what you feel. But, uh, you know, uh, Jimmy can do things that a freshman can't do. Each guy's an individual, and Jimmy can do things that a freshman can't do. I think it's important. But I feel that if I haven't brought Jimmy along to the place where he can do that, he is not mature enough to be <coughs> sensitive to me, that he doesn't love me, I, I feel that Jimmy right now should have uh, enough experience and should be trained well enough that he's going to make the decision like I would make it. Okay? That's the idealistic viewpoint, maybe. But I, I, I go for that. Idealism. I believe every athlete that by the time he's a senior, if he isn't, then usually he's cut out of the system. Okay? He's eliminated from the system. He usually eliminates himself, too. I think that's important. I think you should have the kind of system where the guy pulls himself out. And I, I don't think you should have to cut. We're, although we'll talk about cutting later on when we get into philosophy, how to cut an athlete. I think there's times that you'll have to do that. And I have done that. I have done that not because I was totally right and the athlete was totally wrong. I think there was times that we were both right. I think there was times that maybe the athlete was right and I was wrong. But to keep an atmosphere of what we wanted to achieve as a whole team, I have done that. I would probably cut him. And then we'll talk about it. That sounds pretty strong. Fortunately, we've never had to come to that very often. Okay, so this is the team that... Uh, time of the year philosophy let me emphasize that man we're spending I am emphasizing uh, over and over and over and we're bringing it out in devotions we're bringing it out in practice we're we we're finding guys right and left we're strong when they're in the room late we are setting strong standards and strong guidelines but it only takes about a month or two for them to get into the system and understand what it's going to be about and I tell you if you've done the right recruiting and if you're sensitive as a leader yourself if you really love the guys, it's going to turn out so that pretty soon you don't have to. But you don't have to. The kids are are themselves. They're stronger. They're more disciplined and putting stronger guidelines on themselves than you would want to put on them. And it's really neat to see it work. And you, I think you guys will get to experience that. With experience, if you become coaches, 
You'll find out how that works, and it's a beautiful thing to watch guys respond according to Scripture and to really watch that growth and unity together. Okay, team direction. And uh, what, what, I'm going to go over this pretty much because when we get into the area of philosophy and we start going through the West Neal's book, it has good guidelines on how to start a, a, a first of the year, your first team meeting, what you should do. And there's some things that I want to bring out. <clears throat> this is the time that you're trying to stimulate your leadership. What I mean by stimulate, you've given them a responsibility. This is the time that you're right on them. You're, you're meeting with them weekly. We have weekly meetings with my leadership. Did you do your job? Why, you know, why didn't you do it? How are you feeling? What's the atmosphere of the team? Allowing good interaction, good communication to your leaders. Okay, this is the time of the year that you need to, that this is the time of the year that your upperclassmen can really be essential in making your program go. What I mean, uh, the freshmen are going through a lot of difficult things, transfers, and you as a coach can help them all. It takes other guys on the team, and, and this is where you can nurture that, hey, we're a team. We're not a bunch of individuals with one coach, same coach. We're a team, and this is the time of the year that, you know, it's like you've got ten coaches. Everybody coming back is a coach, and they, they really sensitive to the younger guys. They're trying to help them. Uh, they see a guy down, they hey, what's wrong, you know, or their encouragement. And this is what makes a quality team. You as a coach can't do it all, but you can stimulate that leadership. You can stimulate that, that growth as a team. You've got to have guys underneath you that are willing to do that. We'll come back and cover it, because there are some key administrative things that you have to do. You're getting officials, you're working on your budget for the year, you're, man, we're getting reservations at nationals. This is what you're doing in September in the preseason. You're, you're really doing a lot of administrative things. Publicity program, your transportation schedules, your practice schedules, your paperwork, you've got insurance, you've got checkout procedures, you've got press book information, you've got pictures, you've got to reconfirm your schedule, you've got administrative things with donkey basketball on that. You've got meal arrangements. You've got equipment room procedures. Okay? So we're going to come back.